My name is Christy Lawrence. I'm coordinator for the Sandwich Arts Alliance Literary Arts Group. And we're very pleased today to announce our second annual uh, program for Meet the Authors. All these people you're going to be meeting have books for sale at the Sandwich Arts Alliance, but recently they've come out with a new book, which is the purpose of this program to introduce that to you. Uh, you'll hear from writers of fiction, of memoir, children's books, poetry, humor, and advice. These writers come from very diverse backgrounds, a uh, French instructor, playwright, headhunter, a doctor, a Scottish lassie, a pastor, and a writer who is now quarantined in Amsterdam. So, uh, as I said, keep in mind, these books are available to you and uh, be sure and look them up online or at the Arts Alliance Center. And now let's let's meet our very first author, uh, Paulette Boudreau. Uh, Paulette is a uh, Arts Alliance literary member uh, who has a, a BS from Bridgewater State University and a master's degree from Middlebury College, as well as a diploma from the Sorbonne uh, as a uh, uh, Fulbright scholar. During the 1980s, she worked at the French consulate in Boston and the, the, the French government honored her as a knight in 2010. Boston, My Blissful Winter is her debut literary translation from the French. Thank you, Paulette. Okay. In this presentation, I will talk about the book, a little bit about the author, and how I came to translate this book. I'll go through a pictorial synopsis of the 12 short stories, and we'll let you know where you can purchase the book. So, uh, about the book. The title of the book, is, as Christy told you, is Boston, My Blissful Winter, Memories of the 1980s. It's 12 short stories about a young French banker who's been assigned as an intern in a Boston bank and is experiencing Boston for the first time. He visits many different venues and he meets people from many different backgrounds. If you look at the bottom, an excerpt from the Kirkus Review says, a highly pleasant collection of episodes set in a vanished Boston. And this is the picture of the author in 1989. The book is a paperback. It's about um, 140 pages long, and it costs $15. The author, Alain Briotte, devoted his career to French diplomacy. He was the Council General of France in Boston from 1985 to 1990. Now, the usual term of office for a Council General is three years. He loved Boston so much, he was able to convince his superior to, to extend his stay to five, term, five years, and he wrote the book after he left Boston. It's written as a fiction. These stories are fiction, but fiction based on his real experiences in Boston during those five years. The book was published in 2007. I met the author uh, in the 1980s, when I was working at the French Cultural Services in Boston, shortly after the French book was published in 20, 2007, the author asked me if I would translate the book. And at the time, I had my own business and was very busy, so there was no way I could do that. Um, fast forward to 2014, we were in Paris, and by then I had been retired for a few years. So I asked him, if he had found anyone to translate his book. And when he said no, I said, I'd like to try just to keep up my French language skills. So he said, well, do the first chapter and send it to me, which I did. And he replied, continue. And that's how I got started. So the first, the first short story, late one Sunday afternoon in winter, we find the French intern's initial reaction to Boston while sitting at a cafe on a snowy afternoon at the corners of Chestnut and Charles Street on Beacon Hill. From there, he observes different people passing by and we read his reflections about their different personalities. The reader is also introduced to Beacon Hill, Commonwealth Ave, Back Bay, and the author's fascination with the flashing lights on the top of the John Hancock Tower, which forecasts 
of the weather. In this story, it's a Saturday morning. A banker is preparing a speech that he must give at Faneuil Hall to announce the winner of an ice sculpture contest in the shape of the Statue of Liberty. It's 1986, the centennial celebration of the Statue of Liberty. His secretary has been asked to come in on Saturday to type his speech. She brings her young son with her and she reveals her opinions about the politics in Boston at the time. Dukakis was running for president. Barney Frank, Barney Frank had just come out of the closet. And do you know the historical significance of this grasshopper on the top of Faneuil Hall? The intern is invited to a dinner to celebrate the feast of the Magi, a typical French tradition where a galette or a cake is served. There is a bean in the cake and whoever has the slice of cake with the bean or the pea is the king or queen for the day. The hosts are a French American couple who met in Paris during the liberation of France. We learn about the challenges of war brides who become expatriates to marry American soldiers after World War II. Reading this chapter, you'll be reminded of the typical home furnishings of the time, like, like overstuffed furniture. And remember those big TV consoles. And remember that craze, what's your color? Where a woman was a, where women were advised uh, what color clothing they should wear based on their hair coloring, their skin tone, and the color of their eyes. So as in many of the stories, there is a surprise ending in this one. The reader is in a taxi in the pouring rain, going to the international newspaper kiosk in Harvard Square to purchase the early morning edition of the Boston Sun Globe. Have you ever driven from the South Shore or the Mass Trentike extension to Harvard Square and in the rain? Do you remember how to take the Mass Turnpike extension where you have to take the exit and then a left onto Stravo Drive onto the Anderson Bridge to get the Harvard Square. Well, I worked in Cambridge for a while. And the vivid description of this chapter always reminds me of the stress of driving this trip. And historically, did you know that this kiosk here in Harvard Square was removed a few years ago? We learn of Jack Kerouac's childhood in Lowell, his relationship to his mother, some of the people he knew. And the occasion is a talk organized by Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso in, in a tribute to Kerouac. We visit the homes, churches, and play areas of Kerouac's childhood and the cemetery where he is buried. On this particular trip, accompanied by a friend from Boston who only knows of Lowell's poverty and misery, we learn about the rich heritage and struggles of the French Canadian inhabitants and the community leaders. In this story, we meet a young couple, both musicians. Shortly after a concert at the Isabella Stewart Godwin Museum, we learn of their separation. The museum beautifully described during the holiday season and the reasons behind the separation serve as a springboard to reveal and discuss Boston's conservatism in regard to accepting contemporary art and music in the 1980s. Both the intern and the young musician reflect on the strength and power of temporary acquaintances and the impact they can have on a person's life. Uncle Charles is 80 years old. He's lived a full, healthy life. And after a stay at Mass General, he is now enmeshed in reflections about the end of his life. As his very last living wish, Uncle Charles asked to be driven to the ocean at Manchester by the Sea, also known as the Singing Beach. Although reluctant at first, through a chance encounter with a stranger on his way to Boston College, who speaks of the ocean as a force leading to God, the banker then recognizes his role in Uncle Charles' destiny and in his final days.
Do you remember the private male clubs in Boston that excluded the presence of women? This period is examined through a luncheon invitation to the Somerset Club at a time when the Supreme Court had just ruled that discrimination, discriminating against women in any form is forbidden. The author gives a wonderful description of the staid and formal atmosphere of the club and its members. Venturing to the Ritz for a Sunday brunch, the intern joins a couple he had briefly met at a recent function. The exuberant and vivid dialogue of the older woman and her younger male companion explores some of the conservative and traditional customs in Boston in the 80s. Now the feedback I get from people who have read the book is that the stories often trigger memories of their own personal experiences. So the reason I included the picture of the dancers here is because in the book is the mention of the Lombarda and the Pasi Doble, and they remind me of my own dancing days in the 80s when these dances were popular. And this story also has an unexpected ending. As the intern and two friends venture into Cambridge to listen to jazz, many of the 1980s popular jazz clubs and artists are talked about. Through their music preferences, we discover how these friends support each other through friendship. Since the music is not to their liking, they leave the concert and travel along the wintry Charles River to the Blue Diner, a landmark near South Station. Comparing the end of winter to their relationships, they're reminded that soon they will be separated. The banker learns of Sarah Vaughan's death on the radio in a taxi ride to Cambridge during a glacial Northeaster in March. The news of Sarah Vaughan's death projects the author into memories of her voice, tonality, music, and his favorite songs, which he sadly compares to his upcoming departure from Boston. In this last story, the young intern sees a painting of a young boy in an antique shop, Marika, on Charles Street, which is still there, by the way. He becomes obsessed with this painting and introspective about his own childhood, about his stay in Boston, which has been too short, and about the lessons he has learned about life. Because, the price, because of the price, he hesitates and is reluctant to buy it. When he finally decides to pay the asking price, the painting has already been sold. I'm not going to tell you what happens next, but there's this parallel between the painting, his life, and his departure from Boston. So where can you get Boston My Blissful Winter? Well, first of all, of course, at the Sandwich Arts Alliance in Sandwich, Eight Cousins of Falmouth, the Market Street Bookshop in Mashpee, you can uh, request it from your favorite independent bookstores or at your local libraries. Uh, the book is in the clam system, as a, matter, as a matter of fact. If you want a signed copy or a personalized signed copy as a gift to yourself or to someone for the holidays, you can email me at paulettepoudreau at gmail.com and I will send you, a, send you a copy. Also, the regular online uh, uh, sites such as Book Baby, Barnes and Nobles, and Amazon. Now, my uh, website is paulettboudreau.com, and there you can uh, see more detailed reviews and bios, uh, recorded excerpts, and even um, events, list of events, contacts, some recorded links, um, and um, many details. So I would like to thank you, and thank you for joining me today, and wishing you a happy holiday. Thank you. Our next author is Dr. Bob Reese. He retired as a physician in 2010 at the, as the clinical uh, professor of pediatrics at Tufts University School of Medicine and director of children, the Children's Protective Program at Floating Hospital for Children at Mass General. A clinician, a researcher, and a teacher in uh, children's maltreatment and on national boards for the abuse of children, he has edited and written many books and many articles on these subjects. He turned to novel writing and uh, has written three books. He will tell us today about his, his latest, which is called Strong Medicine. Bob? 
Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my newest book is called Strong Medicine. Uh, you can see from the cover that there's Rx and a dollar sign superimposed on one another. And that's sort of the essence of what I was trying to say in this novel. This is fiction, but it's based on nonfiction and it's something that could have been taken from the today's headlines uh, about pharmaceutical industry and the prices that are being charged uh, for drugs that everyone needs, not only for their health and well-being, but sometimes for their very survival. It's a, a sequel to a book that I wrote earlier called Double Blind, Double Cross. The protagonist in that book is a Dr. Thomas Barrett. Now, Tom is a trauma surgeon who gets conscripted into the uh, army um, for a tour of the Middle East wars and goes over there and comes back to the United States after uh, terrible things have happened to him there and he has post-traumatic stress disorder. He enters a uh, clinical trial in that <clears throat> uh, second book, the Double Blind, Double Cross book, and um, is asked by the director of the clinical trial to please try to figure out why there's been a sudden change in the response of the patients to the drug that's being used in the clinical trial. He and a couple of other of his co-patients in the trial uh, find out what's going on. And it turns out it's a pharmaceutical sabotage that's going on by a pharmaceutical company that doesn't want this new drug to come to market. Part of the thing that happens to Tom is that he is abducted and beaten badly and goes into coma and uh, comes out of that coma with a paralysis of his left arm. As you can imagine, this is a terrible thing for a surgeon because he can no longer use his left arm to operate. Uh, he uh, sues the pharmaceutical industry after they found out that they're the ones responsible for this, and he gets a sizable settlement, and he uses that settlement to set up a new nonprofit organization he calls Pharma Truth, and that's the subject of strong medicine. It's what Pharma Truth does to help uh, address the problems that the pharmaceutical industry is causing. So Pharma Truth uh, sets up a website and asks people who have had trouble accessing medications, either because of cost or because of their insurance coverage. And uh, he assembles a group of experts on the board of Pharma Trust to uh, help him uh, sort out all of the issues that come up with the people who respond to the website. Um, the people who respond to the website uh, are the characters. They're really flesh and blood characters and they're real people, although they're fictional. And they bring a set of different kinds of problems that they have encountered with drug industry prices and access. Um, they all together put these uh, case studies together and try to figure out how do they address this? How do they get the attention of the government and Congress and so on to rein in these practices of the pharmaceutical industry? Um, and what uh, they are able to do is to find a senator and a congresswoman, uh, one from Massachusetts, one from Ohio, to uh, introduce legislation into the um, uh, Congress to address the major reasons that these things are going on. And what happened during the writing of this book is kind of interesting, I think, also, in that uh, I was writing it before the election, this election. And I took a leap of faith uh, that we would change administrations and be able to get this legislation through. And as it turns out, um, I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, prophetic about that. And the end of the book um, tells how the legislation moves through the Congress and what happens as a result of the legislation. It also uh, 
uh, gives some idea as to the personal lives, all the, ma the major characters in the story. Uh, there is a romantic interest with Tom Barrett, uh, actually two romantic interests. And then there's another uh, character who is very central to the, the plot, whose mother dies of a, uh, of a an infection in the hospital and she becomes very interested in a new drug by a pharmaceutical company in Cambridge. Uh, and it turns out that that pharmaceutical company is uh, uh, unethical and they're pricing this new antibiotic uh, way out of reach of most people. And it deals with her interaction with the head of this pharmaceutical uh, 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 company. And uh, what happens to them is a, a side story. Now, the book was published by um, eBook Bakery, which is a, uh, a small independent hybrid uh, publishing uh, company. They've published all three of my books in the past. Uh, and it was published, this uh, particular book was published in 2020 in September. It's been out, out of the market just for a couple of months. Um, and it's been getting uh, quite a lot of good reviews. I'm going to read you one of the reviews that um, a judge um, from uh, New Jersey wrote, um, Judge Richard Cohen. He says, during a long and productive medical and academic career, Dr. Reese never lost his capacity for outrage at injustice and corruption. In strong medicine, he sum summons Dr. Tom Baird and other people we learned to care about in his last no novel, Double Blind, Double Cross, to embody and express his outrage at the wrongdoing of so much of big pharma, to pro prove the enormity of the consequences of the wrongdoing and to design a roadmap for correction. Dr. Reese tells an absorbing story and after reading it, it is impossible not to share his outrage. One other reviewer wrote, and this was Lou Stern, a psychologist. <clears throat> he says, once again, <clears throat> excuse me, Bob Reese's passion for righting wrongs, sharing his love and skill in medical intrigue, and his deep knowledge and lifetime of experience as a compassionate physician benefit us all as his dedicated readers. In these crazy times, it can be hard to get into a book, but Bob has a talent of quickly capturing and turning and keeping your attention. Tom Barrett is back and fighting his personal demons and the bad guys for all of us. Turn the page. It will be hard to stop reading till you get to the end. Now, the audience that I intend this for is almost everybody who ever goes to a drugstore to get his or her prescription filled. It also de deals with the opioid epidemic, and that's been in the news recently, uh, the guilty verdict um, and the, uh, the, the guilty plea by Purdue Pharmaceuticals and the fines that have been levied against that particular uh, manufacturer of opioids. That is, is in the story as well. Uh, the, um, the story itself is just so contemporary. Uh, it's unfortunate that it is so contemporary, but it is a very contemporary issue. We still have to deal with the problems in the pharmaceutical industry uh, and the problems of um, the cost of drugs for everyone. Um, I don't want to read an excerpt from the book because I think there are many ex excerpts that I think would be appropriate, but I would like people to read them for themselves. Um, but I do think that it's important to emphasize that there are um, ways to mitigate the problems of the, the drug costs and the drug industry um, issues that I point out in this book. Uh, and they need to be addressed, and I hope that the new administration and the new Congress will have the courage and the backbone to go after the issues in the pharmaceutical industry. I also want to emphasize that not everyone in the pharmaceutical industry is corrupt or unethical. This is like so many other parts of our society. There are a few bad apples that do these things 
but the rest of the industry is not necessarily uh, in the same boat. So I hope you'll uh, uh, get to the uh, bookstores, to Amazon, and uh, to all other places that you might uh, want to access this uh, book. My website is www.robertmreese, that's R-E-E-C-E dot -E -E com. And um, I have, a, the website does go into a little bit more detail about the book and, and how you can access it or any questions that you might have about the book. I hope you'll get the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope it'll stimulate your uh, outrage at what's going on and you'll be part of the solution uh, of the drug uh, problems that we face in this country. Thank you. Our next author is Dean Coe, also a member of the Literary Arts Group. He's a former executive recruiter and camp director. And he's written five very popular Chesterton children's books based on an experience that he had with his granddaughter with a real life weasel. Uh, he can tell you more about that if he, if he wants to go into those details. Most re recently, Dean has, has written and published Wild Moon, his first chapter book. Uh, and he will tell you all about it. Dean? Thanks, Christy, for the interview or for the introduction. And thanks for all you've done for uh, putting this together and for the Arts Alliance um, and helping writers. Uh, you really have done a, an amazing job and I wanna thank you for that. So yes, I'm gonna talk about a new, uh, the new book, uh, Wild Moon, but I wanna start with uh, the first, which was Chesterton Keeps His Town Jumping. This was about the boardwalk and uh, it was um, the Sandwich 375th anniversary. I wanted to put the first Chesterton book out. And as it turned out, it was a story about the boardwalk, which has been a favorite issue for me for years in this town. Um, the interesting thing is that I wanted to have kids illustrate it. And when I met with some teachers and principals about having um, students in town illustrate the book, I was told that it's probably going to be more cumbersome than um, I want to tackle. Go to the high school and find a good illustrator there. And if you're determined to have a kid illustrate it and make that work. And I did. And I found Robin Wapples. And uh, she was a senior. She uh, read the script. She said, I can do this, but I need some help. And she went and found a, um, brought in a friend of hers who was also an illustrator and um, Sasha Rudyakov. And the two of them tackled this. And uh, there are, in the first book, you will see uh, pictures of, of both the gals. They did this book in their first year, their, the first book in their senior year at high school, and then um, went off to college to Northeastern for, uh, uh, for um, Sasha and uh, College of Savannah, College of Art and Design for Robin. And we still did, we still kept working together. And we did four more books while they were in college and they illustrated those. The way they divided it up was that, um, Robin was great on the characters. She did the characters and um, Sasha was wonderful with colors and doing the landscape in the background. And um, my first book, their first book, I'd never worked with an illustrator. They'd never worked with a writer and we're still talking. So that was a great experience. And uh, that moved us on to the next one which was um, a story about uh, Chesterton and some puffins that are blown in from a nor'easter storm. And he brings his cousin Otter into the picture to take care of the, um, these uh, folks that needed some help. And we have Chesterton, Scary Breakfast. This is just a fun story, but there's some good stuff in it because Chesterton screws up. He makes a mistake. He winds up, uh, it winds up um, affecting other people besides himself, but it's a cute story. 
And uh, we have Chesterton uh, Saves the Whale. This is interesting in that it was based on a, a, a personal experience where I was kayaking in the marsh down uh, by the boardwalk, uh, found a pilot whale that was alive that had come ashore. And uh, it's a story about that whale. It does have a children's ending, which is different than what happened in real life. The last of the picture books, uh, Robin wound up doing the design and all illustrations on this one because uh, Sasha was just too busy with school. Uh, and this is about the New England cottontail. And in the back of it, I have a um, infographic that was put together by uh, US Fish and Wildlife. And it talks about Thornton Burgess and it talks about the um, the cottontail and the disappearance of the cottontail. That's a great book. And that's it for the uh, for the um, picture books. The kids in town kept saying, when is Chesterton going to give us a uh, chapter book? And so I finally yielded and um, to, to their request and put out Wild Moon. Uh, the illustrators had gone on to bigger and better things, and so I was in search of a new illustrator. And Carol Acomp, who's also with the Sandwich Arts Alliance and a wonderful illustrator, artist, um, agreed to do the cover for me of this. And uh, this is a story about uh, wildlife on Cape Cod, and I'm going to read you just the back, the, uh, back cover. Something very strange happened on the night of the first autumn full moon on the shores of Cape Cod Bay, where 13-year-old Dylan Winchester and his mom were camping. Dylan's special connection to animals enables him to piece together a live puzzle and with the help of his friends, design a game plan to help wild animals. And I, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't go on and read this quote. Wild moon reminds us that we're all connected, weasels and rabbits, owls and voles, coyotes and people, and that when we work together, we can save the world. And that quote is from Cy Montgomery, who uh, was willing to give me the blurb for this once I sent her the script. Cy, of course, is a, a National Geographic um, documentary writer and she now has a show on um, on uh, in Boston on Fridays uh, WGBH and um, has done uh, has put out about 28 books on wildlife including the soul of an octopus and the good pig um, fascinating part about this book was I decided I needed a beta group I needed kids to help me with this and so went to the uh, school uh, Sandwich school system and was able to get a group of eight kids, three fourth graders, three fifth graders, and um, three sixth graders. And I gave them the script, typos, everything, rough draft. And we sat down and we did, we had 10 weeks of working together uh, with this group of kids that went through the story with me line by line. And uh, I found them to be very honest. You know, you give a book to your, to your family members or your friends and say, read this and tell me what you think. And you get nice positive comments. However, um, the kids were real and they were very helpful. And so that's a, uh, the story of uh, Wild Moon it does have a twist to it. And that is that the main character in this book, besides Chesterton, is a 13 year old uh, young boy on the spectrum. And so it introduces um, the, the, um, the fact that uh, he does have some special skills. And um, the kids in the uh, beta group were wonderful. We even brought someone in, uh, the principal of the school came in and met with us and talked about autism for the kids. And um, it's, uh, it's an interesting dimension to the book and uh, hopefully introduces kids to 
um, the benefit of uh, a young boy that has a special learning, um, but also has a special skill in his understanding of animals. These are available um, at Titcom's. They're all available on my website at www.deancobooks.com and uh, and through New England uh, booksellers. I am not, uh, they're not on Amazon. Uh, that decision is yet to be made. Uh, all of the books, except the last one, have a glossary. They're all, they all take place on uh, Cape Cod and the marshes and the woods and um, all have a running glossary. So uh, creatures that are described are also uh, mentioned in the glossary in the book. Um, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk about these and um, look forward to um, orders. That would be nice. I am working on a book right now in uh, Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire for a special project where Chesterton is going to visit uh, Sandy Island Camp. And uh, that book is going to be out in the spring, hopefully. Have a good day, everybody. And thanks for being here. Our next author is Christina Laurie. She's an ordained pastor and as a poet has written and published several successful poetry books and several children's books as well, including most recently a lovely Christmas book, uh, Christmas, The Christmas Lobsters, I'm sure she'll tell us about that. But uh, her most recent book, uh, I think it's uh, just about to come out actually, she'll fill you in those details, but it's on cats. And uh, Christina, we look forward to hearing about it. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Christy, for that introduction. And thank you, Heather, for all the work you're doing here tonight. Um, I just want to echo Dean's thanks to both of you and to the Sandwich Arts Alliance. Um, I'm really excited to share my new book with you. And I haven't even had the book in my hands. I have a photograph of it. It's called Per Poems, Kittens and Cats. There. And the picture. Uh, is a scratch board that is done by another um, Arts Alliance person, um, Carolyn LeCompte. And when I saw the picture in the one of the exhibits, I just fell in love with it. And I said, I've got to have that on my book cover. And so we worked it out and there it is. And um, I love I love that cat. So that, that's the book. Um, I should be getting this shipment today or maybe Monday. So I'm really excited about getting it. I haven't even had it in my hands. And it, it, right now, um, obviously it's not any place um, for sale, but I'm, it's going to be at Eight Cousins and at Titcom's and at Market Books Shop. And also it's $11. It can be through me, my, um, my website, um, christinacapebooks.com, christinacapebooks.com. And also um, on my email, which is preacher, poet, P-R-E-A-C-H-E-R, -E preacher, poet, P-O-E-T, at comcast.net. So um, I, I think I'll just read the beginning of the introduction because it tells you where this book started. Um, during the summer of, 19, of 2018, my sister Becky and I visited Russia on a river cruise from Moscow to St. Petersburg. And on the trip, we stopped at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And as I walked across the stone um, patio um, and going up to the museum, a cat wound itself around my legs. And I, I reached down to pat it, but it scooted off toward an entrance underneath the stone steps that led up to the large wooden doors that we entered. When we got there, we were told that um, the the Hermitage, which was the museum, which was a, a palace of Elizabeth, who was the um, daughter of uh, Peter the Great, um, had built this in it for her home. And um, there were a lot of mice that were running around in it and in, in the corridors and stuff. So she um, procured a bunch of cats to chase these mice, mice and catch them. And they are now living in the basement. There are over 60 cats now in the, in the Hermitage Museum. But at the time they were catching mice and keeping them under control, which she was very happy about, I think. But um, I, so I'd written a couple of 
um, poems about cats before, but I somehow got inspired by by these cats that were all over the place, and they were wandering around the the um, property after we left. Um, and so I started writing poems about cats, and this really is my COVID book because I spent the whole winter writing cat books, cat poems, and I'll read a couple in, in a little while. Um, it wasn't it wasn't hard to write. It was very easy, and I would fall asleep and start thinking about a cat poem, and I'd be driving and, and have to stop and write a cat poem down, and I'd be sitting watching my two cats play, and a poem would come to me. So it just went on and on, and all of a sudden, I must have had 70 poems, and I talk, I called my editor, and I said, you know, I've got a bunch of poems here. Do you want me to put them into a book? And she said, send them to me. So we spent um, a good part of... Um, September and October, working on editing it and putting them together in, in a certain order. And um, we have a, I have a wonderful graphic artist in Colorado, and he just put the whole thing together. And it's, it's the, the pages look like they're wrinkled paper. And then he's got little um, illustrations on each page of cats. It's just, I love it. Can't wait to get it in my hands and, oh, and read it. Um, it the, the book is for cat lovers and anybody who is interested in cats. Um, because they're just all different kinds of cats. And I will read one that was in our um, earlier poetry book that the, the Alliance published called Pebbles in the Stream, um, which was a commissioned poem for a woman who lost a cat. So I'll read that in a little while. Um, there are many different kinds of poems in there. There are playful cats and there's um, a few about grief pet cats. Um, many, many names of cats, um, a lot of them drawn from friends like Albie and Mittens or, or friends' cats' names. And um, a lot of different kinds of cats like um, this, this uh, the coon cat and there's the feral cat. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but um, this is Norwegian forest cat that's in there too. And a whole bunch of other kind of cats. Um, I was when, when we were um, in in Russia and um, in the museum. We we had there was one cat that scooted across the marble floor um, and went disappeared really. And I looked and I thought that's one of that's in the poem. So there's one on, with marble floors. There's two poems really about Hermitage as it is. What it, the book begins with one of them, and um, the rest of them are are all different kinds of poems. So I, I thought I'd read a couple of them and um, and then um, share with the rest of the books that I've written. So the first one I was gonna read is called Summertime at the Beach. Waves spill across the sand in the morning sunshine. Under the boardwalk, the feral cat licks his paws. Eyes half closed, he purrs. In the sand, a mouse lies inert. And then um, my my sister's favorite one of this is called this is the one that um, I I wrote for the um, pebbles in the stream and it's called absence. Um, a silent house, an empty lap, no purr to soothe, no grace to pat. That's grace is the name of a cat. The tears that fall are caught by none. My heart is wrenched. No cat to come. Yet years of love, de devotion shared, her memory stays, how much I cared. Life goes on, friends come and go, memories hold, and love still grows. And that was in the Pebbles of the Stream. Then one of my favorites is called In the City. Under the sunshine of a city sidewalk, an old man hair disheveled, beard curled and knotted, sleeps crouched on a hissing grate. A thin worn blanket covers his body. A cardboard box is his pillow. He snores sonorously. A bushy black coon cat slips into the crook of his arm. And this is a scene that I actually saw in Boston one day when I was, I was walking. Um, through the Boston Commons, so it was it's a kind of a memory poem. And then um, I have a couple of short, a uh, number of the poems are, some of them are short, some of them are longer. Um, this is one of the short ones, it's called Dissonance. Practicing piano, 
a young boy in frustration bangs the piano keys. In the woods, a cat yowls. And where's my other one? This one, I my, my editor said, this is called Banquet. My editor didn't like this. She said, I don't like that at all. I don't, I don't, I don't want you to read that. And she, every time we came to editing, she just said, well, we'll she, she just wanted to skip it over quickly. It's called Banquet. The rabbit lies inert on the lawn, an island of beige and white in a sea of green grass. The cat brought back from the fields last night. The crows jump from limb to limb, cawing to each other in discernibly different, discernibly different tones. They drop, first one, then three, to the grass below. Charging across the lawn, they find their meal, and with cynical, be crooked beaks, they attack fur and bone. The cat, crouched on the windowsill, observes the feast, arches her back, and settles down. She seems satisfied with her contribution to the feast. So those are a few of them, and there's a lot more you can read. This is about 70 poems there. Um, just wanted to show you a couple of things. I first, my first publication of my books was, this is called Inspiration Interludes, um, picture done, this is done as to raise money for the Penn women um, in, in support of the house that we have, our, our clubhouse in Washington, D.C. And one of the other artists, one of the artists that drew the picture for the front of it. And that's that's just a, a series of um, interludes that I wrote, I read when I was chaplain at the the um, at Penn Women National League of American Penn Women, and I was this was on the national board, and at our board meetings, I would read some of those. So there's a few of those with illustrations that I did. And this is now that's my third book. This is my second book, which is all um, haiku, and this is at Sandwich Arts Alliance. Um, it's fourteen dollars. Um, I donated ten to the alliance, so they're they're going to make all the the profit on this. And it's a, a collection of haiku. Most of them are. It's 575 haiku, which is um, an older uh, haiku has changed a lot since I first wrote this book. This came out in, in I think, 2010. And um, I've, I've done a lot of different haiku since then, but they're, those are the ones. And then this is my third, my, my second poetry book called Song, can you hear it? Song of the Dancer. And I do some illustrations in here also. Um, and these are just um, a, a collection of my poems and um, some illustrations in there too. Here's one. One illustration. And the poem is that, well, that's a dedication. This is another, another illustration that I did. I'm trying to. There we go. And the, the poem there is um, at sunshine. It's a tanka. In the winter valley, three infant birds in a nest lie dead. On the branch, their mother still sings to greet the dawn. Then my first children's book is The Sea is for Cape Cod. And um, photographs were done by Steve Hazlip, who is a, a, an award-winning photographer from the Cape Cod Times. And inside each letter has um, a, a, a four-line poem for a, a, a young, that a young person can, can read. Um, uh, let's see. And it has uh, the F, the letters are big so that kids can learn the alphabet. And then underneath the, this picture particularly um, is, um, um, tells about fishing and a lot of I did a put a lot of research into this book um, to give a lot of um, it's my cat in the background <laughs> um, I did a lot of research in that book to um, just show um, tell people about about Cape Cod so a lot of people have been buying it that have come as tourists to listen and to to, to share in the Cape and, and they bring the bring it have brought it back home and then this this is the one that Christy mentioned the lobster's night before Christmas. And last year it sold over a thousand copies from October to December. Um, I don't know, we haven't had as many as book signings this year, so I don't know, but it's in the bookstores, it's in Titcombs, it's at Eight Cousins, it's at Market Street Bookshop, it's also on Amazon. Um, 
And it's also on Schiffer Publishing um, website, which is um, the ones that um, actually published this book, Schiffer Publishing. But this is um, just one of the pictures done by, let's see, I'm having trouble getting this. The two lobsters there. And it starts out, "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the ocean, not a creature was stirring. There was simply no motion. The skate cases were hung on the reef with care in hopes that sea Santa soon would be there. When out on the ocean sprang a bubbly mass, rising behind swaying eelgrass, from the holes of our cave, each of us dashed to search for the trouble that what made us splash. A shadowy figure on the crest of the waves seemed to hover above our ocean caves. And that's, that's Santa that's coming down to uh, fill the skate cases with toys for the lobsters. So that's about it. Um, those are my books and I, I'm working on a book now um, for, um, on, on Lucretia Coffin Mott, M-O-T-T, -T, who was born on Nantucket and is now, um, was a suffragette. She was the first suffragette. She was born in 1893. And um, she's the one who led the whole suffragette movement and, and taught and encouraged others like Elizabeth Cady Stanton that are much more famous than she. So I want people to know who she is. And she's an, an, uh, an ancestor of mine. So I'm kind of proud of her too. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening, and I wish you all a Merry Christmas. Our next author is Karen Magar, and I'll give you one guess after she's been speaking shortly to know where she's from. Uh, but I'll give you a hint. It's Scotland, uh, one of the best countries in the world. And uh, Karen has written a new book. This is, this is her first memoir. Uh, titled Tales of a Wee Scottish Village, and I, I look forward to reading it. Uh, she's written a lot of plays, short story, uh, I mean, short, uh, short plays that have been uh, produced locally uh, to very enthusiastic audiences. I've been, I've been one of those people. And so, uh, Karen, we look forward to hearing about uh, your new book. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about my new book, my memoir, Tales from a Wee Scottish Village. Um, thank you for the Sandwich Arts Alliance for the opportunity. Um, my book is a collection of short stories that I wrote over a series of quite a number of years after my parents, who had lived in England for many years, both Scottish, but they moved to England for many years, decided to uproot unknown to me and move back to Scotland to this tiny village with a population at the time of 239 people. So they left what was essentially my family home and went to this place where I had never been. So this book is a collection of stories of their introduction to the village and my introduction to, my to the village and my son's introduction to the village. Um, it's my first book. I decided to self-publish it because I've heard all the stories um, from people as amazing as JK Rowling and her Harry Potter series and how she had such a difficult time being published as a first time author. Not that I'm saying my book is Harry Potter because it's not, but just that process sounded incredibly lengthy. And I didn't want to take all that time to put something out there. I, want, I felt like it was a timely issue. Um, I had lost both my parents and I felt like I wanted to do something in their honor and to take years and years to get something published just didn't seem very interesting. Um, on that same note, the recent winner, uh, a fellow Glaswegian like myself, Douglas Stewart, the author of the incredible Shaggy Bain, um, if you haven't read it, it's an amazing book. He was rejected by, I believe about 30 publishers. So hearing these things just said, let's just do it. And the process was interesting. It's been quite a labor of love finding out how to do all these things that I had no idea. So next time around for my next book, which will be ready in a few months, I feel like I can do it all now. So that's helpful. Um, I wanted to just talk about um, the book itself and how it's all come out. Uh, the cover design is by Donna Rockwell and Sandwich. And she's done a fabulous job. Um, I've got the clothesline, obviously, which is very representative of 
village life where everybody hangs out there washing, um, sometimes in a literal sense as well. Um, and this picture is of the bridge um, at the cottage where my parents lived after they had lived in England. Um, so I wanted that sense of humor because it, it's a memoir and it's humorous and also the sense of place, which I love that the bridge, which is very dear in the book and the very central to the book. Um, when you read it, you'll realize the significance of the bridge. Um, on the back, I'll just read what, um, what we came up with on the back. And I love that she did the uh, washing line around the back cover as well. Um, I'll read the back cover to you and then I'll read the prologue and then I'll talk some more about the characters. Um, We're going home. My dad's voice boomed through the phone from 3000 miles away. I thought England was home, I said, my tremulous tone filled with surprise. It's time to go back to Bonnie, Scotland. And with that, my parents moved to a village deep in the heart of Robert Brown's country with a castle, a pub, a shop, a population of 239, and the wee cottage built in 1740 that captured the hearts of all who, to have come, who have come to know it. Pour yourself a cup of tea or a dram, curl up in your favorite spot, and enjoy these tales from a wee Scottish village. So what I think I'll do is just read the prologue um, just to set it up, and then we can chat for more. Get this in a good position. Prologue. With tears streaming down her cheeks faster than she can wipe them away, Mum waves frantically as the coach reverses slowly out of the bay in Buchanan Station. Huddled it get together against the cold and smur Scotland is known for, the small cluster of family and friends that have come to see us off wave and blow kisses until their silhouettes become blurry. As the coach sharply rounds the bend, I catch a quick glimpse of Dad in the seat behind. His smile that I usually find reassuring does nothing to calm the somersault my stomach does when I think about the new school I'll be starting on Monday. Reaching between the seats, Dad lightly squeezes Mum's shoulder. You got eight, Lizzie? Aye, she sniffs, patting his hand. I'll be fine when we get there. Only seven hours to go, oh, he says in a sing-song voice. You okay, hen? Uh-huh, I fib fixing my gaze on the dog-eared copy of 84 Charing Cross Road that my teacher, my English teacher, pressed into my palm the day before, long after the prefects had given up on any hope of an orderly exit. I've read it more times than I care to admit, Mrs. McAlpine had uttered in her broad Doric dialect. And if truth be told, I doubt I'll ever make it as far as London, but it cheers me to think there might still be wee bookshops just like it. With more than a slight blush, she added, owned by a man like Frank. I didn't have the heart to tell her the town we were moving to was 60 miles outside of London, created purely to aid with, what, with a post-war housing shortage. Built on existing farmland, Milton Keynes in the county of Buckinghamshire boasted of a grid road system comparable to that of New York. Pamphlets provided by the Milton Keynes Development Corporation stated no building would be taller than the tallest tree while accompanying literature displayed glossy pictures of houses of every description. Two months prior, Dad showed up for his shift at the car plant in Linwood, where a few years before, he'd narrowly missed losing a finger whilst working on the assembly line that churned out Hillman imps. After clocking in alongside the men he'd come to know during his dozen years of employment, word spread across the factory floor that the doors would be shutting that day for good. Rather than delay getting caught up in the mass exodus, Dad took his leave and made his way back to the bus stop. From his seat on the top deck, he gasped when he saw the line of men snaked around the Glasgow building that housed the job center. With the imminent addition of several thousand more about to lose their livelihood and the declining 1981 economy, he stayed on the bus. From across the dinner table, Dad looked like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders. And for the first time in my life, I got sent to bed. When I heard the creak of the kitchen door being shut, I sensed serious change was afoot. The very next day, Mum and I stood on the platform at Glasgow Central, waving to Dad as the train groaned its way out of the station. Many months before, Dad's lifelong friend had moved down south. Now married with two daughters, 
Harry and his family were enjoying life in the place Dad described in his letters as booming. Within a couple of weeks, Dad secured a job with a new home improvement company, and with each phone call, he sounded chirpier, excited at the prospect of the three of us being together again. You won't believe this place, he gushed. There's new houses spouting up everywhere. One of those houses, an end of terrace with three bedrooms and a garden the size of a football pitch, was to become ours. Hours were spent on the phone discussing what mum coined the English move, a phrase she tutted with an extra dose of disdain whenever she'd hang up from talking to dad. She'd roll her eyes and ask me to help her pack, allowing me to choose what I wanted to take. Invariably, she'd say there was something she had to tell her sister, mother, cousin, niece, friend. The closer it got to moving day, the longer mum spent on the phone with her closest kin, most of whom had never lived more than a few miles from where they were born. True to my 14-year-old self, I soon become bored with the Victorian architecture. My interest peaked only by the sight of the landmarks I've come to know from recent jaunts to the city centre with my best friend Linda, who I've promised to write to at least once a week. I bury my head in the pages of Frank and Helene's contrasting worlds and quickly lose myself in their transatlantic love affair. By the time the winter light fades, mum is out for the count, the top of her head pressed against my shoulder, her chest slowly rising and falling in a way I don't wish to disturb by reaching up to turn on the light. My drooping eyelids give into the lull of the engine and I drift off into a nightmarish scenario where I show up at my new school wearing my old school uniform. Waking with a start, relieved that it was only a dream. I look out at the pyres dotted across the flat English landscape. Guy Fawkes, my mouth, reclaiming my arm. The jerky movement stirs mum awake. Would you look at that? She exclaims, her eyes widening at the sight of the flickering flames, reaching as far as the eye can see. When dad pops his head between the seats and hisses, boo! Mum and I scream the same piercing sound that causes the woman seated a few rows in front to shake her permed hair and cluck disapprovingly. Stifling a giggle, I slump into the seat while mum cranes her neck in dad's direction. Is that the only head bonfires in London? Apparently not, he responds, his Glaswegian accent given the first word four syllables. Hopefully the new hoose will still be starting. Mum looks at me. Did you know about this? Why, of course, Mama, I frown, with my best attempt at received pronunciation. The legend of that dastardly man, Fawkes, traversed from the Suti chimney stacks of Lindinium all the way to the craggy hills of Caledonia. What's your wish, Messy? She says with a playful swipe to my leg. You're no too big to get leathered. A few minutes later, Mum draws a heavy sigh that prompts me to ask her if she's okay. I, it's just... Her voice trails off and she dabs at her eyes. Dad's handkerchief appears between the seats. We'll be fine, Lizzie. Come and sit with me. Signs for Milton Keynes begin to appear. My stomach churns with a mixture of excitement and dread. I can't wait to see the new house and pick up my bedroom, but I'm fretting about my bike, hoping it will arrive intact and in time to get me to school on Monday. Shortly after exiting the motorway, the driver navigates an endless number of roundabouts. These bloody things are making me dizzy. Mum says, lolling her head from side to side like something out of a cartoon. Ignoring the freshly painted white lines, the driver parks in one of the dozen or so empty bays. And with the engine hissing our arrival, we disembark, leaving three passengers remaining on the bus for the last leg of the journey to London. Posters with no trace of tattered edges show smiling children in part like settings holding red balloons. Looks like the ragman's been Mum mutters under her breath, her eyes glinting with mischief. On the concourse, a vending machine illuminates the corner of the otherwise stark grey building. Go and get me where I am, Blue Hen, she pleads. Good luck finding that down here, Mrs. The driver remarks as he passes on his way to the toilet. Slouching in front of a row of metal benches offering zero comfort against the November chill, my ears prick up when a cabbie with a cockney accent so authentic it sounds fake asks, where to, Gov? Speaking much slower than usual, Dad gives him the address. I am the excess amount of luggage. The cabbie cocks his head. You coming here to live? Dad nods his response and the cabbie slaps his meaty palm against the shoulder of Dad's corduroy jacket. Good on you, mate. Reaching for the biggest suitcase, the cabbie glances in my direction. This one yours, Treacle. Offer bricks and mortar about your age. 
can't keep up with all that top of the pop stuff she blasts up the apple and pears. He looks at mum. We trouble and strive, strive says I spoil it. He shrugs in dad's direction. As the women may, innit? Two roundabouts later, the cabbie points to a mirrored glass structure, the likes of which I've only ever seen in the TV show Dallas. That there, my friends, is the new John Wayne station. There's a rumor, he taps a finger to his nose, that the old baked bean herself would be cutting the ribbon. In nothing resembling a whisper, mum says, where's he seen? I catch the cabbie's wink in the rear view mirror as mum nudges closer to me. Do you think everybody here will speak like that? Nah, love, the cabbie chirps. Just the old muckers like me from London. Mum looks at me expectantly. They said everybody here speaks like that. Oh, you too, Dad chuckles. As the cabbie pulls up outside the house, my parents will call home for the next 17 years. The stories provide a bird's eye view into life in the wee Scottish village. And a lot of people have commented on places that they've come from and how similar it is, which I think is quite interesting. Um, lots of uh, remarks I've heard from, I've heard from people all over, which has been incredibly encouraging and very exciting and that lovely feeling of connection between people, especially now when we're all being stuck at home. Um, I think it's a nice introduction to Scotland as in the Scottish people, you'll hear a lot of words, you'll read a lot of words in the book that are in Scots dialect, um, some of which you might, you've, you've just heard, in particular Glaswegian dialect, which is, I'm from Glasgow, so my initial dialect was Glaswegian, um, and my parents were very Glaswegian right till the end, and they never lost that. So there's a real capturing of the Glaswegian dialect, which people have been really enjoying and sending me little snippets of them recording their reading of the Glaswegian dialect, which is quite amusing and also very lovely. Um, I was just trying to think what else. My parents are really the central characters in the book and they were characters in their own right. Um, a reason that I started out with Memra as an initial, as an initial book was there's no um, there's no lengthy plot that you have to keep up with. There's these vignettes that you can just come in and out of, which I think is quite nice because maybe now our concentration isn't quite as great as it usually is. Maybe that's just me. So it's nice just to have these little stories that you can pick up, go into Scotland for 10 or 20 minutes and then leave again. And that has been something that people have said. Um, the reviews have been, um, here, from here and across the pond have been plentiful and very positive, which is very exciting as a, as a first time author putting your baby into the world and not being quite sure how it will be received. So that's been very encouraging and very lovely. Um, the book is available on all uh, Amazon platforms worldwide. Um, and it's been interesting seeing where people are buying it as, you know, as far away as Australia and France and all over the UK, obviously in the US. So that's been very nice. It's also available at the Sandwich Arts Alliance in Sandwich. It's available at Titcom's Bookshop on 6A in Sandwich. It's available at Eight Cousins in uh, Falmouth, on Main Street in Falmouth. If anybody would be interested in a personalized signed copy, I'd be more than happy to do that. You can contact me, uh, my email is Megar, M-C-G-A-R-R, -R, Karen, K-A-R-E-N, Karen at gmail.com. And I look forward to uh, hearing from you. I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you very much. Our next author is June Bowser Barrett, who is a playwright and a prose writer. She's worked as a former high school teacher, a community college writing instructor, a gender equity consultant with the Mass Department of Ed, and she's been a coordinator for the Sandwich Arts Alliance Performing Group. As a playwright, she's written 40 short plays and two full-length ones. This, however, is her first prose book, and it's a, a very funny book, and June will tell us all about it. Hi, June Bowser Barrett here. It appears that we are, I am doing this interview with myself, um, which is a little unusual, but actually it fits in with the book that I have, which is 
when the voices in my head formed a chat group. So I think I'm doing this interview with the voices in my head this morning. Okay. So the book was published um, out of Providence, Rhode Island with eBook Bakery, uh, Michael Grossman, who is the um, editor um, and the publisher, wonderful guy to work with. Actually, I met Michael at a uh, Sandwich Arts Alliance publishing event two years ago at the Sandwich Library. And there were a few publishers there. But um, listening to Michael, I thought, you know, if, if I ever decide to publish a book, I'm going to call Michael. Fortunately, I kept the material from that um, session and called him this summer when the lockdown from the pandemic finally gave me enough time to put this book together because I always said, you know, someday I'm going to put this book together, but you know, other things interfered. So it's a soft cover, very soft. <laughs> 174 pages. And um, of course, I didn't write the whole book during the lockdown. Um, the book came together from several writing groups that I've been in over the years. Um, the latest one was with ALL, the Academy for Lifelong Learning. Um, out of uh, Barnstable. And we met as a group every Thursday for a couple of hours for, well, I guess I've been in this group since for maybe three years. So you can, you can produce a lot of material in three years. Um, I finally got to put it together um, and got in touch with Michael and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, so, I have to thank a couple of people at ALL. Um, one of them is Wade Sayer, also a Sandwich Arts Alliance person, who was very helpful and kept saying to me during these sessions um, from the writing group, what are you gonna do with this stuff? And I'm like, I don't know, what am I gonna do with it? And so finally, um, I found something to do with it. Uh, it what audience was I aiming for? Um, I think somebody once told me that you should write what you like to read. And what I like to read is entertaining humor. And sometimes it's just really hard to find enough of that. So I'm thinking about people like Irma Bombeck. I love to read Irma Bombeck. I love to read, going back a few years, um, Jean Carr. Um, please don't eat the daisies. I loved uh, Loretta LaRoche. I've seen Loretta in person a number of times and just loved her stuff. Dave Barry, of course, is still working and incredibly funny. So I think um, those were the voices in my head I was listening to when I put this together. But it is a memoir. And I just went back over parts of my life, which I realized were very, very funny if you think about it in that way. Um, so it's, it's in sections. The first part's about my family, which is a very funny section, if you're not my family. So they don't even know about this book and I'm not going to tell them because they might not like how they were portrayed and they've never thought they were funny. I've always thought they were hysterical, but that's another story. Um, and then there's a section on school, because I taught school for 25 or so years. So there's that. And I was in school for and probably close to 20 years also. Um, but overall, the book is humor. And it's, it's designed to kind of be the antidote to 2020, when we've all had enough gloom and doom to last us probably the rest of our lives. Um, so if you read this book, uh, it's possible to read it in episodes. You don't have to read the whole thing. Um, and I hope that you will smile when you read it. As the lawn signs say, be the reason someone smiles today. Um, somebody said, um, have you gotten feedback on it? Yes. Um, of course, most of the people who have bought the book and read it are my friends. Um, so the feedback's been good. I'm waiting to get other feedback from Amazon. 
because people will review it there who don't know me and may not be so kind. But, you know, humor is very subjective. Some people think that something is hysterically funny. Other people don't even crack a smile. So, um, so the feedback I've gotten has been, it's very amusing or it's hysterically funny, depending on how you connect with the stories in the book. So um, I'm supposed to read uh, an excerpt from the book, but I don't think we have time for that. So I'm going to just read you what my editor wrote on the back cover, which is supposed to, I guess, get people to want to read the book. So it says, when the voices in my head formed, a chat group has one objective only, to entertain. It's not written to persuade, justify, enlighten, or inflame, and comes when we all need a lift. Bowser Barrett sees the world in comic takes that are universally recognizable. Who hasn't had a house guest from hell? And what overworked teacher doesn't know the fallacy, but you get summers off. Fat ass breaks toilet takes us back to Catholic girls school in the 1960s to a battle between the girls versus the rules with the nuns determined to win. Irish Spring introduces a charming Dubliner determined to sweep the author off her feet, but what else is he looking to sweep up? And just a little fire makes us laugh at the fact that there is no such thing as just a little fire. And what reader can identify when she wins the bad dates contest? And these and other reco recollections her voice is quick and the humor underplayed. And since when the voice is in my head is episodic, read it in spurts or devour it all at once. In either case, you'll return to it repeated, repeatedly, most any time your mood can use a boost. Um, so that was my purpose in writing it, just to be entertaining and have people smile and lift their mood. Um, Somebody asked me about the title when the voices in my head formed a chat group. Actually, it came from a friend of mine. We had another friend that was so unusually off base that uh, one day my friend said, you know, she's getting so bad that the voices in her head aren't talking to her anymore. They're talking to each other. And I thought, well, that would be a pretty good title for a book when the voices in my head formed a chat group. And so that's what we went with. And um, I hope you get to read it. And if you do, I really, really hope you get to enjoy it and laugh and smile. Thank you. Our next author in the Sandwich Arts Alliance Literary Groups Meet the Authors 2020 is Alvina Baxter Moran. She has a background in financial planning, sales, and training. So this is, this is stepping out with her very first historical novel. As a child of seven, she learned the value of books and imagination. And the story that she's going to tell us about is one that she believes has been waiting for her, waiting for her to tell through her research and her writing. So Albina, let's hear about it. Hi, thank you for inviting me on the Sandwich Arts Alliance, and I am honored to be here. Um, as you said, Christy, the novel that I've, I've just completed, um, Lily's Chair, is my first historical novel. However, throughout my life, professionally and um, just for an avocation, I've always loved history. History has been something that I've found fascinating and important to know. So I was able to incorporate the historical facts of the last, well, the last 100 years and write the narrative of my story, my family's story. And Lily's chair is about a young girl um, who committed a selfless act of heroism. And she saved a young boy's life. By doing so though, she irretrievably changed her own life. And as her life went on and she and her mother emigrated to America, they came from Germany, emigrated to America. She believed that everything was going to be as she dreamed. Well, it wasn't as Lily dreamed. However, 
Lily's dreams did come true, just not in the way she had anticipated. Um, so this is the story of how Lily achieved her dreams, along with how a young baby girl who had been abandoned years later, abandoned and left at an institution, ended up living her dream, having her dream come true. So it's, and it's actually based on facts and events that occurred in my family. So um, I am excited to present it. I'm excited for people to, um, to hear it. And if you would like, I'd be happy to read a section from you, for you. Would you like me to do that? <laughs> so as I open the book here, Afraid, confused, and sleepy, she pushed back against the hand with all of her strength. She had been squeezing her eyes tightly shut, but now she was trying to open them. The room was dark. It felt burning hot, and her eyes were beginning to sting. She heard crackling sounds. She heard screams. Voices yelled, get out, fire, run. Her heart was beating faster. It was becoming harder to breathe. Disoriented, she didn't know what to do or where to go. Yelling, she screamed, I can't see. I want Big Red. All of a sudden, she felt the hand again. This time, it grabbed her roughly, pulling her off the bed, dragging her half asleep and tired body across the floor, screaming at her, yelling, run, Marion, run. It's on fire. And with that, um, that's just simply one episode in the story where um, life sometimes changes immediately. And that is how it, it happened for Marion at that time. Is there anything else I could say that you would like to know? No, no, that's good. All right. One, two, three. Hi, I just do want to let you know that Lily's chair is going to be available at both Titcombs Bookstore and Sandwich on Route 6A, and also at the um, candy store, the uh, 1856 candy store in Centerville. And they uh, and also um, it is available on Amazon. It's, I will say it's a good winter's read. It's uh, approximately 500 pages. Story begins at the turn of the 19th century, and it brings us up uh, and up through up to 2005. Uh, and there, um, it, it does cover some incredibly historical events. And I, I have to say that as I was writing the book, so many of the topics that we're discussing today are also topics that were dealt with by the individuals who are in the narrative. Uh, so if you'd like to put an order in at Titcombs or at the candy store, 1856 candy store, please feel free to do so because they are anticipating that. And thank you. And the name of it again is Lily's Chair. Uh, and the chair plays a pretty critical and relevant role in the whole story. So that's that was something that obviously was inside me waiting to be told. Thank you. Nice. Resume recording. Um, one, two, three. Hi, thank you for inviting me on to the Sandwich Arts Alliance. I am so excited about being able to offer my first historical novel, Lily's Chair, being offered at the Sandwich Arts Alliance. This is a great winter read. It's a, as you notice, there's this beautiful chair on the cover. That chair plays a pretty critical, or not even pretty, a really critical and relevant role in the story of Lily's Chair. Um, Lily is a young woman. It opens up with Lily, Lily as a young woman. When she was uh, in her early teens, she saved a young boy's life. And by doing so, she irretrievably changed her own. Lily believed that her dreams as a young woman were going to come true. Because of her heroic act, they wouldn't. However, Lily ended up finding her dreams and they came true in a different way, just not the way Lily thought. And the chair is actually a wedding gift that Lily receives. And um, it does, as I said, it plays a really relevant and critical role in her, in her life story. However, at the same time that Lily is realizing her dreams are not gonna come true, a young child is abandoned 
at an institution. And that young child then, of course, believes that no one's ever going to love her and that she will always be alone. Well, the irony is that as Lily's dreams might not come true in the way she wanted, they come true. And that little girl's dreams will come true also. Lily's um, chair is about 500 pages long. It's 1995. Um, it is a great winter read. It covers a time period from the early 1900s right up to 2005, covering five generations of a family. And it's actually based on factual um, events in my own family. And of course, I had to create the narrative behind it, which is why we call it historical fiction. And it's a, um, a great gift also. And again, it's going to be offered at the Sandwich Arts Alliance. It will be offered at Titcombs and also at the 1856 Country Store. So I'm hoping that when you're looking for a Christmas gift, you're thinking, you know what? This looks like something that would be good to curl up to under a warm blanket. So thank you very much for letting me be on, for inviting me on the Sandwich Arts Alliance. I appreciate it very much. And our next author is Mary Pettit, who is a poet, a writer, and a publisher from Barnstable, who finds herself quarantining at the moment in Amsterdam. She has written Moontide, which is a lovely collection of poems, and will tell us about her latest book titled Owl Magic, Your Guide Through Challenging Times. We can all use that. So thank you, Mary. I have two books that I'd like to share with you today that I have published um, just in this year in 2020. Um, the first book is my poetry collection. It's called Moontide, and it's a collection of Cape Cod poems. And the second one I'm going to share is called Owl Magic. And Owl Magic is a toolbox of strategies to guide you through the current difficult times we're all facing today. Um, I'm going to start talking about Moon Tide. And it's a book that I wrote um, over a period of about three years while I wandered the beach with my dog every day. And it seemed like most times we took walks, I would get a poem after the walk and just write it down. So I had a big manuscript of poems hanging around. And when the lockdown, the first lockdown came for the pandemic, I finally had time to bring the poems together and uh, make them into the book we have here. So uh, it, there it is. It, it's sort of the silver lining to the situation the world is in right now. I think a lot of people have more time to do things they might have been planning to do for a long time. Um, so it, it's been the project of about three years, which just came together now. And I think the hardest part about a book isn't writing it, but it's actually promoting it, what I'm doing right now. That's, that's the hard part, if anybody were to wonder about that. Um, this book was written for anybody who loves Cape Cod. It's for all of us. It's my gift to Cape Cod. It's for Cape Codders, where you know, Cape Codder could read this book and maybe recognize themselves or their friends, or maybe recognize the places I write about. And a visitor to the Cape would find this book a great souvenir to bring back with memories. It's divided into seasons, and uh, some of the poems, uh, th they describe things that I've really seen and things that have really happened. So I, I'd be delighted to read a poem to you now uh, from Moontide. It's called Deep Freeze, and it's one of the winter poems, which I think is good for now because we're going into winter. So here, this is Deep Freeze. It got so cold, the harbor froze beneath gunmetal skies and the ice cracked and the black dog stood out in stark relief against the whiteness of it all. Finding frozen schoolies along the icy rack line to carry proudly up the iced and beach cold beneath her warm sharp teeth. The black ducks stood out in their own star small relief and found no open water Yet the ice was treacherous and held no weight and the icebergs piled higher and even the channel froze and it was as if the very ice age had returned. Once the black dog ventured far out onto the ice and hearing it shift and crack and fearing it would break, I called her back to safety. I wrote that one um, the last time the harbor froze during the winter 
and I wrote it uh, with relief because the dog did come back and didn't go through the ice that day. <laughs> so that's an example of um, a poem from Moontide. And my other book, Owl Magic, this is a toolbox of strategies to help um, manage and cope with the times we're living through because they're difficult for all of us. And it, the book is sort of coming from the, from the um, thought that times of change can be the times of greatest transformation. So it's a hopeful book about how through this change, we can make something better. Um, it's a simple, anxiety-busting strategy collection, helping you reach your highest self and reveal your hidden power. So I'm going to read um, a little bit about the idea of abundance so you can get an idea of what's in this little treasure box of books. Um, here we go, abundance. Um, so th these are ways to attract abundance to yourself and ways to practice it to help others. You can practice generosity with the assumption that there is enough. Leave a tip if you can and pay the coffee ahead. Give a smile and you'll get one back. Reach out, especially if you are in quarantine or a friend is. Check in with each other. Give the smallest of gifts, a flower, a shell, freshly baked bread. Give the gift of your time to a good cause. Give with love and give with free abandon. It's about generosity in that part. And it's about how generosity begets more generosity. And this book includes guided meditations, um, yoga poses, writing prompts. So I'm going to share just a few writing prompts as well. And I'll give you more of an impression of what's in here. Okay. Um, this chapter is about facing fear and the writing prompts are, what is your greatest fear? Has fear saved your life? Make a list of the things you fear. How do you feel when you are frightened? Has fear held you back? How can you transmute the energy of fear into the energy of change? Um, this book I wrote during the first lockdown. Um, I had a lot of time and I was developing my own strategies to cope with the situation myself. And I share those strategies here. So um, I guess the hardest part and the easiest part of writing this book at the same time was actually living through it. And hopefully it can help you live through what we're all living through. Um, I've had some great feedback. Moontide has done really well on Cape Cod and I'm really grateful to all the Cape Coders who have supported this little book. Um, and Owl Magic, I, it just released, it's just come out. So I'd like some feedback from any of you who might read it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sandwich Arts Alliance. Thank you for everybody for listening and happy holidays. So this is the conclusion of the second annual Literary Arts Meet the Authors series. We've had seven wonderful accomplished writers here today and we hope that you will take a look at their books, which you can find at the Sandwich Arts Alliance now uh, during holidays, especially or online or at Titcombe's bookstore. But this, uh, this series is an opportunity for you to understand more about the writing process and to appreciate the diversity of the writers. You've heard a humorist, you've heard a children's writer, you've heard a fiction writer. And this is all available to you in on the bookshelves at the Sandwich Arts Alliance. So we hope you'll come in and visit us and uh, stay tuned for other upcoming literary arts uh, series like this. Thanks very much for taking part in this and taking an interest in writers.